Okay, so today we'll be talking about my clicker is working. Social class and family inequality. Okay. So in this lecture, we'll be covering how the economy has shifted in, since the 1970s, how education and uh, degree levels affect families and how social class can influence parenting and how families are formed. The main thing to note is that the labor market has shifted dramatically over the last several decades, leading to a polarization in the job market where the job market has increased for the most educated workers and the least educated workers, but declined for people with moderate education and skills. So people with um, high school degrees or some job experience. Employment has um, become really precarious as well. Uh, there is less job security um, and fewer benefits today than there were in the past. Overall, the job market has been really awful and it's shifted our country's um, distribution of wealth, uh, which has led to a huge impact on families and family structure. So in this lecture, we'll be discussing how these changes have impacted families for better or for worse. In recent years, family science research has focused on the concept um, called family inequality, uh, which is the extent to which some families obtain more income and wealth than others do. There's a few differences for why this may be um, a common theme in the research um, or why it's occurring. But one of the main themes in the research is the focus on differences in education level and the importance of education as a means to raise a happy and healthy family. Education levels are a strong predictor for the types of families people will live in um, and how financially stable they are. So people with college educated degrees are more likely to have lived in uh, two parent households and more likely to raise their own children in a two parent household as well. Two parent families are typically better off because they can pool the income of both adults. Um, and the average income of married couples has risen over the past couple of years because college educated couples are more likely to marry so they're making um, a salary that is a little bit better off because they are college educated and because they can pool those two salaries together. Although single parent families have risen due to the rise of divorce and non-marital childbearing across the board, people with less education are more likely to raise their children in single parent households and their children are less likely to go to college in the future. This is partially due to the lack of income single parents are able to bring home and single mothers are at a higher risk of living in poverty because they typically make less than their male counterparts. Because of these shifts in income um, between uh, single parent and two parent households, we are seeing a gap between the incomes of the college educated and the less educated widen even more than it has before. Because of the difference in education level, there have been shifts in other demographic variables that could explain the growing uh, family inequality in the United States. People with college educated degrees are more likely to marry, but they get married much later in life when compared to the less educated. Those with a college education are more likely to get married, but they tend to wait until their careers um, are more established and they're financially stable, or if they have a are pursuing graduate school to get married. Although they tend to wait until about their 30s to get married, college educated people are more likely to get married than those uh, with less education. Most college educated women wait to have children until after marriage, while women who with less education are more likely to have children outside of marriage and are less likely to marry the child of the father later on, or the father of the child, I should say, later on. College educated women are more likely to wait until their careers are established and they have been married for a few years before they decide to have their first child. However, women with lower levels of education are more likely to have a non-marital childbirth and less likely to marry the father of the child because research has found that they are still hoping to find a partner who has a better income or they're waiting until they are financially stable um, to get married. For less educated women, having, having a child and being a mother is a reasonable accomplishment that they can attain and obtain quickly rather than having to wait for finances or resources um, that may never come. 
uh, in order to have that child. Education level also influences who will marry who. So there's this concept known as assortive marriages, and that's the tendency of people to marry others similar to themselves. So college graduates are more likely to marry other people who also have graduated from college. Uh, college educated people are also less likely to get divorced. So in the 1960s and 70s, the risk of divorce was pretty equal across all groups, um, regardless of education level, but um, in the 1980s, the risk of divorce began to drop for college educated couples specifically. Overall, those with higher education levels are more likely to marry, less likely to divorce, and more likely to have children with their spouse after marriage. So far, we've talked a lot about education differences in family structure based um, on degree attainment or the level of degree that they have and how families can differ based off their jobs and education, but we haven't necessarily defined social class yet. So social class is defined as the ordering of all persons in the society according to their degrees of economic resources, prestige, and privilege. At the core of this definition is how income and wealth influence what your social status may be, but life chances and status group can also influence your social status um, or social class. Life chances are the resources and opportunities that people have to provide um, themselves with material goods uh, and favorable living conditions overall which can influence your education attainment, which can be influenced by um, education attainment, uh, nepotism, and social connections. Social status, or uh, not social status, but status group, is a group of people who share a common style of life and often identify with each other. So people among a certain social class are more likely to spend time with people in that same social class. So upper class people are more likely to spend time with other upper class people because they have similar lifestyles and have a similar understanding of each other or are running in similar circles overall because they have similar, similar interests or resources. Social status or social class can be divided into four different um, classes or what's called a four class model. Okay, oops, went too far, okay. So upper class families are those who have a lot of wealth and a lot of privilege. Um, about 3% of adults identify as being part of the upper class. They tend to own really large and spacious homes, expensive items, designer materials, um, expensive cars, maybe multiple cars and new cars in particular. And they make large financial investments to further their future, whether that's buying stocks, I'm not really understanding of like the investment thing, which may be an indication of my social status. Um, but people who buy stocks think Wall Street kind of people, I guess. Um, husbands within these families are typically wealthy managers or owners of corporations. Um, they tend to be really high up in their field. And the wives are um, typically don't work. They don't need to work, so they don't need to do um, a dual income household. So they're usually homemakers or um, they'll raise their children or they'll um, engage in volunteer work, things like that. But they don't work for pay because they don't need to. The next class is known as middle class. So middle class families are those whose connections to the economy provide them with a secure and comfortable income. 40% of adults identify as being middle class. Typically they have some college degree bachelor's or graduate work nowadays is typically required to be considered middle class and they work mainly office jobs and their jobs provide them with the benefits like retirement, um, health care, uh, family leave, things like that. Um, they're also able to afford a nice home, a car, or specifically a newer car, um, and other luxuries like being able to go on vacations, um, buying nicer items for clothing, not necessarily, you know, $3,000 purses, but, you know, they can afford these more nicer luxury items um, without breaking the bank. Our next class is going to be what's called the working class, and working class families are those whose income can provide um, reliably 
for the minimum needs that their family has. So 40% or 47% of adults identify as being part of the working class. They can afford a modest home um, or apartment, uh, whether they're renting it or they own it. Um, they can typically buy a car. It's usually a used car and they might have one or two cars, but again, it's not like the nicest car or the newest car, but they do have cars. Um, and they could technically or feasibly be able to pay for a community college for their children uh, versus other social classes would be able to pay for a four-year university or a private university, but they can typically pay for um, community college for their children. Working class men typically have blue collar jobs while women are more likely to be nurses or teachers or um, when we think about these families, they're dual income earners and they typically have very hands-on jobs um, that require maybe some schooling or some kind of tra trade school. But again, they're both working and they're both in very hands-on fields. The last um, class is known as lower class and lower class families are those whose connection to the economy is shaky and cannot be, um, they aren't, able to reliably provide for a decent life or for their basic needs. 10% uh, of adults identify as uh, being lower class. They tend to live in deteriorated homes or multi-generational homes or subsidized housing um, provided by the government. Um, typically, they can't afford basic needs. So things like winter coats, um, groceries, or enough groceries to get their family by. Um, and as a result, they may need to rely on government support through food stamps or programs like WIC to help them make, uh, meet those basic needs. Although families of different social classes are relatively similar um, because a lot of these families are made up of dual income earners, uh, they typically have children, things like that. Uh, there are two key differences between lower class families and upper class families or working class, middle class, and upper class families. Those two key differences are assistance from kin and the type of assistance they may, may receive and then the differences in parenting styles and child rearing. So during the Great Depression, when people experienced extreme poverty, most men lost their role as the head of the household because they were no longer able to financially provide for their families. As a result, family members and extended kin would come to support the family and often take more of a leadership role in the family that the husband once held. In communities where there is low or no employment among the men, mother and women will rely on kinship ties for support and often rely on other women specifically, which leads to women-centered kinship networks among low income or low class communities. In this particular network, women will help one another raise their children, provide each other financially, and will often live together. They're just typically pooling resources to kind of make it through and to raise their children. Among low income families, kinship provides a lot of support for families who are struggling, but it can also come with limitations because most families will have to divide their limited resources among multiple family members, which can kind of put a strain on econo the economics of the family. Oftentimes low income families do not receive financial assistance from kin because of the limited funds, but will receive practical assistance like childcare. Among non-poor families, there is um, less of a connection with kinship or extended kin. Among these families, um, parents are expected to provide for their children and not necessarily other family members like your aunts or uncles. They may provide for you know, their parents and grandparents, but that's pretty much as far as assistance typically goes. They also tend to have weaker links between family members because among those families, the conjugal family, which is typically the wife, the husband, and their children are the main focus, not extended family and the connections to the extended family. So kinship ties are much weaker. 
researchers have also found that values, um, oops, sorry, it's not showing. There we go. I don't like these transitions that they put in these slides, but I, they, they always suggest them, so I put them in, but maybe I've learned the lesson. Anyway, researchers have found that values in parenting styles tend to differ based off social class or by social class. Typically, working class parents believe that obedience, conformity, and good manners are the most important values that should be taught to children. On the other hand, middle class and upper class parents believe that children should be encouraged to be independent, creative, responsible, and curious. Uh, a potential reason for these differences is the values um, that the parents place on their children or what they believe is important to teach their children may be determined by the responsibilities or the types of jobs that these parents have. Middle class and upper class families also tend to engage in um, parent, a parenting style known as concerted cultivation, meaning these families work to actively enhance their children's talents, skills, and learning. Oftentimes these parents will sign their children up for extracurricular sports and tutoring to encourage their child's growth and overall development. They typically also spend time, more time with their children and tend to focus on activities that will developmentally enrich their child's life. Low income parents are more likely to engage in a parenting style known as natural growth. In this parenting style, parents will focus on providing a safe environment and letting their children figure out their own interests and goals on their own, not necessarily pushing their children towards extracurriculars. Um, or outside activities, but letting their children kind of find those resources and activities on their own if they have interest in them. They also tend to have strong kinship ties and relationships with where children can get support from other adults beside their parents. So it's more of a parenting style that kind of goes along the lines of it takes a village to raise a child. I do want to say that although those parents aren't necessarily encouraging those children to do extracurriculars are doing things like signing their kid up for dance classes or getting tutors for their children it's because or spending they typically spend less time with their children that's because of the economic constraints and also their availability as parents to be involved because oftentimes parents in low income uh, working class uh, families are working one to two jobs, typically very long hours um, within these jobs. So they don't necessarily have the resources or the time to spend time with their children as much as they probably would like. I also wanna note that neither parenting style is better or worse, but each style is determined by access to resources, not the parent's ability to parent. Oops, sorry. So, Let's recap. The association between the type of family you live in and your social class is stronger than ever. Um, this has highly, been highly influenced by the movement of married women into the workforce. So when we look at the different social classes, we typically see um, low, lower income, working class, middle class women working while it's only upper class women typically who don't have to work. Um, there's also been a decline in employment for men without a college education, which has really impacted um, the low income or low, lower class families. And it's also encouraged women again to go into the workforce. Dual income spouses are more common than ever as a result because of the shifts in the economy. The cost of living and having children has risen, which has also led to that dual income family and people today are waiting longer to marry because they want to ensure that they're able to financially provide. Specifically, um, college educated people are the ones to wait longer to marry and have children, but also when we look at lower income women or women who um, are less educated, they're also waiting to marry because they are hoping for more financial stability before they marry. It doesn't necessarily impact when they have children, but it does impact when they do get married. Um, and we also know that low income families are more likely to be headed by women. Typically there's these uh, women kinship networks and there's also um, single parent households are more likely to be led by women as well. So that's kind of the recap and some things you should probably keep in mind for your exam. 
All right. So that's our lesson for uh, chapter four or lecture four. All right.